January 12, 1983, Governor Dick Riley was inaugurated for a historic second term. This is the story of that day. Inauguration Day activities began early in Columbia. Usually this time every four years, one family is moving out of the governor's mansion on Arsenal Hill in Columbia, and another family is moving in. But this time, because Governor Dick Riley won a second term, the family that woke up this morning in the mansion can rest a little easier knowing they'll be here another four years. Governor and Mrs. Riley invited all elected officers being sworn in to a breakfast this morning at eight at the governor's mansion. Along with the governor, Lieutenant Governor-elect Mike Daniel of Gaffney will be sworn in, along with the constitutional officers, Secretary of State John Campbell, Treasurer Grady Patterson, Comptroller General Earl Morris, Adjutant General T. Eston Marchin, Superintendent of Education Dr. Charlie Williams, and the newcomer to an office which, although not specified in the Constitution, is considered a constitutional office, at being Commissioner of Agriculture, Les Tyndall, and another newcomer, incoming Attorney General, Travis Medlock. Good morning. How you do, sir? Doing pretty well. How is this different <clears throat> than four years ago? Well, it is different. Uh, it's, uh, it's exciting, just as exciting as it was four years ago, but certainly uh, where you're bringing in a whole lot of new people uh, you're in a state of decision making regarding that this time uh, I have a staff I have people I know the constitutional officers well and all of the legislative leaders and uh, I started a uh, in the middle of the race instead of in the beginning of the race I feel like and I'm excited about what we can do for South Carolina briefly how do you personally feel this morning Are you excited well I'm excited uh, I didn't sleep a whole lot last night the uh, I, I suspect that's natural, but uh, it's a lovely day and lovely weather, and we've got a lot of lovely friends. Thank you. Following the breakfast, the officers, along with Governor and Mrs. Riley, and Governor-elect and Mrs. Daniel, left the mansion for a motorcade to Trinity Cathedral for prayer services. Trinity Cathedral on Sumter Street faces the State House in Columbia and was the site for the traditional morning prayer services before inauguration. Services began at 9.30. Following prayer services at Trinity Cathedral, people gathered at the south side of the State House for the inaugural ceremonies. We asked several where they came from and why they came. I'm from Gaffney, South Carolina. I'm down for uh, Mike. I went to school with Mike Daniels. Is that what brings you here today? That's the only thing, and this kind of weather would bring me out, I think. <laughs> Casey, South Carolina, and I'm also a friend of Mike Daniel. Well, I'm from beautiful downtown Loris, which is in O'Ree County. I'm here to see my governor re-inaugurated. It's a very historic day, and I'm proud of uh, our governor, and I, he's done a, a good job this first four years, and I'm sure he'll do a great one the next four from Spartanburg and I feel like this is going to be a historical event that will never happen again. I'm from Gaffney, South Carolina and I came to see the Lieutenant Governor Mike Daniel. The first oath was taken by Lieutenant Governor-elect Michael Daniel of Gaffney. It was given to him by United States Senator Ernest F. Hollings. As Lieutenant Governor, Daniel will preside over the State Senate. I, Michael Roland Daniel. I, Michael Roland Daniel. You solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I am duly qualified that I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties of the office to exercise the duties of this office to which I have been elected to which I have been elected 
And that I will, to the best of my ability, and I will, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof, discharge the duties thereof, and preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States, so help me God. The Constitution of this state and of the United States, so help me God. I declare you officially installed as Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. My personal congratulations and God thank you very much. Lieutenant Governor Daniel then administered the oath of office to the constitutional officers, Travis Medlock, Les Tyndall, T. Eston Marchant, Earl Morris, Grady Patterson, Dr. Charlie Williams, and John Campbell. Gentlemen, if you will, raise your right hand to receive the oath. Do each of you solemnly swear that you are duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties of the office to which you have been elected? and that you will do to the best of your ability, discharge the duties thereof, and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. So help you God. I therefore declare you officially installed in the office to which you have been elected. My heartiest and personal congratulations. Shortly after noon, Governor Richard W. Riley stepped to the podium to be sworn in by his father, Edward P. Ted Riley of Greenville. Mrs. Riley stood to the governor's left as he took the oath of office, which will begin a historic second term. Raise your left hand on the book and raise your right hand. Say, I and state your full name. I, Richard Wilson Riley. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state. That I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state. To exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. To exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. And I will to the best of my ability. That I will to the best of my ability. Discharge the duties thereof. Discharge the duties thereof. And preserve, protect, <clears throat> and defend and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. The Constitution of this state and of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. By authority vested in me, I now declare you duly installed <coughs> as governor of the state of South Carolina. Congratulations, and may God bless you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Senator Gresset, Speaker Swartz, distinguished platform guests, and especially my good friend, Governor Jim Hunt of North Carolina, who has joined with us. My friends, on this very special occasion for me and for my wife, Tucky, and for my entire family, I would like to certainly begin by saying to you, the people of this state, thank you. Thank you for what you have helped us accomplish during the last four years. And thank you for the opportunity to continue in that service. Today is one of those few moments when you and I can pause and take a look at where we've been, where we are, and where we may be headed time when we can feel the great heritage and tradition of this state and we can think and plan for her future. But if I may, however, I'd like to take your attention for a few moments away from this place, away from this ceremony, away from government itself. I would like for you to think along with me about a young South Carolinian named John Christopher Hayes. 
who was born only last Monday morning at 8, 10 a.m. at the McLeod Regional Hospital in Florence. There's nothing out of the ordinary about that. He's a fine, healthy baby, and he has proud and happy parents, Johnny and Susan Hayes of Chirault. You know, they have every reason to believe, as you and I do, that young John Christopher will have a long and productive life here in South Carolina. But you know, maybe there's more to the story than just the good wishes we feel on this happy occasion of this young man's birth. You see, young John Christopher Hayes is going to be a child of the 1990s. He's going to be a citizen of the 21st century. And that means that he's going to live in a world beyond our greatest imagination. It will be a world where computers are as common as telephones, where space orbit will be as common as interstate highways, where microchips will be as common as light bulbs. But for all the technology, and for all the Buck Rogers type conveniences, it will also be a world of other concerns. There will be concerns about whether our planet Earth will be a safe place to live. Will the water we drink and the air we breathe be clean and pure? And there will be concerns about whether our streets are safe places to live whether we will feel personally secure from crime in our day-to-day -day activities. And there will be concerns about whether our international community will be a safe place to live. Can you and I avoid the threat of nuclear destruction and achieve world peace? And above all, however, we wonder about people and how well they will adapt to the new world ahead of us. We ask ourselves about young John Christopher Hayes, born only two days ago, and whether he will be prepared for the world which awaits him. And ultimately, we ask ourselves as a state and as a government and as a people whether we will do all that we must to prepare this young man for that world and give him his place in the sun. And of course, these are not easy times in which to face the future. We live in the midst of a recession, and more than 160,000 South Carolinians are out of work. People are worried about their property taxes. People are worried about all kinds of problems and business people a word about going broke. People are concerned about their safety and prisons are overcrowded. And there just seems to be less money to get important things done. People in general and their government are finding it tougher and tougher to make ends meet. While it can still be said that the state of our state is fundamentally sound, and I'm happy with that, South Carolinians today feel economically unsure of their future. Another South Carolinian, Dr. Benjamin Mays, spoke in another difficult era about the impact of hard times on people. And he advised the struggling masses that the great tragedy of life was not failing to reach our goal. The tragedy, this great educator says, lies in having no goals to reach. Thus, as we hear the message around us all today, the message of the complexities of high technology, and the message of hard times, we must also listen to the past, and we must direct our attention to the future. We must listen to the words of Dr. Mays and not deprive ourselves of goals. We must understand the unspoken words of John Christopher Hayes and not deprive future generations of their dreams. 
I make those observations as one who's been blessed to serve as governor for four years. And I speak with the confidence of one who has seen and learned firsthand what the people of this state can do for themselves. Four years ago, I stood here at this podium. And you and I talked about our duty to seek certain important goals for South Carolina. We talked about getting more merit and less politics into government, particularly when it came to decisions affecting people's pocketbooks. It was something the people wanted, and it was done. And we talked about human rights and equal opportunity and letting the governor's office itself be the means of opening the doors of government wider than they had ever been opened to all people. It was something the people wanted done, and it was done. And we talked about keeping South Carolina from becoming a nuclear waste dumping ground for an entire nation of developing a national policy for having all states share in the burdens of nuclear waste. People wanted it done, and it was done. Yes, we talked about putting the public back into the public schools and emphasizing early childhood education, and, and that's what the people wanted, and it was done. And you and I talked about controlling the size and the cost of government itself even if it meant cutting budgets and fiscally holding the line. You know, it was something that the people themselves wanted done, and it was done. These goals, the goals of 1979, have now become the realities of 1983, and they are therefore no longer simply goals. They have become standards for the state of South Carolina standards for you and me, standards for future governors and future lawmakers, standards for our children and our grandchildren. They are standards which must never be revoked, and standards by which we set higher and higher goals for the future. So where do we go from here? How do we build a future for young John Christopher Hayes with the limited economic resources of today. As in the past, as in the last four years, we don't do it with great wealth of financial resources. We do it with the great wealth of human will and determination. In other words, we do it with the best of strength South Carolina has, and that's the people themselves. But those same people, you see, must have hope. And they must care for each other. And they must have reason to have confidence in their future. So we begin by setting new goals. This time, the goals of today, the goals for the generation of John Christopher Hayes, speak for themselves. We must decide what it will take to put this state back to work. And we must decide what it will take to assure that our people, old and young, are prepared to handle the kind of work that the future will demand. In other words, the goals of today and tomorrow can be reduced to two fundamental objectives, more jobs and better education. First of all, let's talk about jobs, and we know they can't be created overnight. In fact, we've done well for many years in South Carolina in expanding, in attracting new and expanding industry, and in bringing new jobs to the state. But we now must broaden our approach. We must establish state policy which will create more jobs for our people, and it will be people who will be better trained and better educated. And while we continue to bring our state into the economic mainstream of our nation, while we continue to upgrade the quality of our training programs, while we continue to raise the level of our productivity and technology, we cannot lose sight of another important factor. And I'm talking about people who have worked long and hard in this state 
who may not have a place in tomorrow's high technology. I'm talking about people who not only need money and income from employment, but who also need the sense of dignity and self-worth which comes from working. I'm talking about people who, who may need retraining and re-educating, but more than anything else, they need a job and they need it now. Henry Van Dyke penned these lines about work. Heaven is blessed with perfect rest, but the blessing of earth is toil. And I believe that. I believe that work is important to our state. It's important to our communities and to our families and to each one of us as individuals. And if toil is our blessing, however, then education is the means by which we achieve long-term salvation for our state. That's not a new thought. For as long as anyone can remember, this state has always put education high on its priority list. But in recent years, we've worked harder and harder. In addition to the allocation of millions of dollars, the professional educators, the teachers, the superintendents, and the administrators have put forth a tremendous collective effort, and particularly during the last four years of this administration, I'm proud that volunteers and parents, and citizens in general, have pitched in with great effectiveness. But for all these accomplishments, we must now do even better. If we're going to build a future for the generation of John Christopher Hayes, if we're going to prepare this state for the 21st century, then we've got to work for an even higher standard of education. We've got to guarantee to every person in this state in a very short time that they will have a safe and healthy learning environment in their very early years. In a very few years, this young fellow will be entering kindergarten. And the school system itself will follow. These are years, the years immediately ahead, in which his future may well be determined. But you and I have got to think about more than minimum standards and minimum competency. You and I must turn our thinking to maximum standards, to maximum competency. We've got to think about standards of quality and excellence, which people can prepare themselves for life in a world that's so complicated and so demanding. It's not enough to say to John Christopher Hayes that we will provide for him a good education, but only if times are good. It's not enough to tell John Christopher Hayes that we will do the best we can with what we have. We must tell him and the thousands of youngsters of his generation that they will have an education which qualifies them for the jobs of the future, whether we are in the best of times or the worst of times, regardless of the times. This must be a permanent standard that we establish. <laughs> the final analysis, you and I must be able to say to the generation of John Christopher Hayes, jobs in education are are more than goals for the people of South Carolina. They are so basic, they are so fundamental, that they go beyond a consideration of standards or objectives. They should be viewed, as I see it, as nothing less than absolute birthrights for every person born in this state. The birthright to work and the birthright to learn. Now it's, it's in our hands, the people of South Carolina. And regardless of economic conditions and limitations, we have the power to make it happen ourselves. And it's without hesitation 
And I say to you today on this very important day to me and I hope to the state that if you, the, the people of South Carolina, want better education, then it will be done. If you, the people of South Carolina, want more jobs and are willing to study and retrain and prepare yourselves, more jobs will come. But I ask of you today only one commitment. I ask of you, please, want these things badly enough. Please decide in your own mind that a good job and a good education are important enough to insist upon. If that decision's made, and if that commitment is made, I say to you that it can and it will be done. You see, this must be our common goal, our common dream. Albert Schweitzer, in discussing the Ten Great Commandments, once wrote that there should have been an eleventh commandment. Thou shalt not kill my dreams. And I say to you that, that no shortage of money, that no economic recession, that no complexity or complication of high technology no struggle, however great it might appear. None of these challenges shall ever kill the dreams that you and I have for young John Christopher Hayes and for the people of South Carolina. Thank you. Following inaugural ceremonies at the State House, the participants and guests moved to face the parade route south of the State House. Over 90 units took part, including 30 bands. Later in the day at the Carolina Coliseum, the inauguration was capped by the inaugural ball. The highlight of the ball, the Grand March with Governor and Mrs. Riley leading the procession, ending inaugural day 1983 and beginning a new term for Governor Dick Riley.